Steve Parrish began surveying for the U.S. Forest Service in 1963, transferred to the BLM in 1985, and served as a BLM cadastral surveyor from 1989 to 1995. He retired in 1995 to pursue private surveying experience. He's licensed in multiple states. Uh, it was 10, but he says he's uh, as he's retiring, he's giving up some. Nevada White Water Rights Surveyor. Uh, let's see. Contributed to the surveying handbook with uh, Brinker and Minnick and is an active workshop presenter still. Uh, he just did our conference uh, this last spring, which loved seeing you there. Um, worked for Tri-State for 13 years, taught the course uh, of the BLM manual for Great Basin College from 2004 to 2016, uh, and received his bachelor's degree in 2009 from Gary Basin. So 60... Uh, 60 years of experience, cadastral surveyor, uh, CFED was part of the CFED program as well, CFED training panel. Um, and as he's retiring, he's giving up all of those. But uh, no better uh, no better person um, to help us at least get through this government lot calculations, parentheticals. This, uh, this particular one started one of uh, one of the kids in my office is going to uh, New Mexico State in one of his homework assignments was uh, calculating the areas of a government lot. And so I thought um, it'd be a great one for anybody else who's going to school. I didn't want to give away the actual uh, homework program. So Steve put something together that would be something similar along that. Um, so I, I appreciate your time as always and your dedication, Steve, uh, and your knowledge on uh, all things BLM. So I will turn it over to you, Mr. Parrish. And, uh, All right. I thank, thank you for your time. Trent, for that introduction and yeah. the opportunity to, um, I guess, end your presentations for the summer. <laughs> yeah, we'll do another one. We're just doing one a month right now. So, yep. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Well, what I'm going to do is approach this um, very basic to begin with, and then we're just going to jump into one somewhat complicated uh supplemental plat down in las vegas and uh, there's one particular township among many in las vegas that uh, will make most surveyors scratch their heads when they get into and i highly recommend um if you get you know sideways with figuring out what to do with the government lots down there get a hold of your blm uh, counterparts down there and uh, talk to them they'll help you through there's been a whole lot of uh, land broke down. Uh, the government's tried to back out in many places down there, and they haven't been able to sell all the lots. So we've got quite a mixed batch of um, one and a quarter, two and a uh, two and a half acre, just dis dispersed among a bunch of private ones and. Uh, and they all fall under an aliquot part of the section breakdown, which really starts with the original survey. So this is just a generic presentation from, basically I'm using slides of what I taught at Great Basin for the 13 years I was involved there. And uh, here we have a um, typical GLO plat and it's uh, 21 North 19 East, surveyed on November in, uh, well, it was approved November 23rd, 1881 by uh, Brenton Proctor, for those folks that might know those uh, individuals. And they surveyed this whole township from July 20 to 26, 1881, a whole seven day wonder again. And you can guarantee they left out a few lines here and there. And um, hidden behind this area here, it uh, also contains 22,939.04 acres. And of course, we all know that's more or less. I'm going to try and find where do I find that uh, pointer again that's Uh, let's see, as maybe, well, I'm you're not sure in there's, a, there's not one that's just a little red dot. Yeah, I was going to say, you're not in uh, presentation mode, so it may not. 
you can just use your cursor if you wanted to. Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and keep doing that. It's yeah, there you go. easier to see that red dot, but yeah. Okay, so um, let's just keep on going down. I broke this down into three processes right now, and not all lots and their calculations are simple and straightforward. The particular ones, and it always makes me a little suspicious when we get back into this township here, you'll see that um, every one of the lotted sections up here have an even number on the closing distance across every one. Well, that makes it a little bit easier. If you happen to have a section, and we won't go into that, it's, it's kind of the same process, but you've got to do a little more meaning. Uh, if you have a section that one side is an odd number and the other an even number, then when you try to work these from the left to the right or the right to the left, you're going to have, come up with some differences. And But usually the center one, the center north one sixteenth or the center west one sixteenth of a particular section, such as the center north right here, section three, that's your key area. It really most of the time does not matter what the parenthetical is between lots one and two and three and four. Because um, it will play a role if you have angle points on one or more of the exteriors. Then it's going to start to uh, uh, accumulate on you and you have to do a few a little bit different calculations but these are all pretty straightforward and this I just want to show you the processes so on this first process going back to it we start with the area of lot one and in a typical lot of one through seven and then seven eight nineteen thirteen and thirty one down the west side of these uh, lotted sections of a typical township and you subtract the record length of the east side of lot one on the north tier or the north side of lot one on the west tier so that's what we're talking about we're going to work on a section three five six and seven so you'll end up with three and five to show, you know, the similarity. Six, of course, that's the fun one and most of the time. And lot number four of uh, section six we'll talk about. And we'll even uh, see where I think that the drafts person has an error on one of these when we get to that point. So what I'm talking about here, it's important to take a look at the distances on both sides. So we have a typical 40 acre, then we have a, uh, excuse me, 40 chain, then we have the typical 20 chain, and up here what we're going to have, we're going to have 2658 for the east side of government lot one, easy enough to follow. On the other side, you've got 2528 for the length. So we've got 2528 for the west side of lot four. Now you notice that they have an area calculated by the drafts persons in there. And in this particular case, you can take a look and you can see that it is a shorter distance on the west than it is on the east. So this plays into one of the processes later uh, going in the area is typically then going to be decreasing in the lot areas as you go from east to west. So let's just take a look what you would do here and uh, I'll break this down. Let me just jump ahead a little bit just to show you what I'm going to do. I'm going to verbalize a little here and then there's all the calculations for you. So you've got it here after I verbalize this. You can keep referring back and forth to see exactly the math of what I did there, okay? So we're gonna take 2658, which is the east side of lot one, and we're going to subtract that from the area of lot one, 5283, 
and so you'll get 2625, and that is the parenthetical between lot one and two, which most of the time is meaningless. But then you take that same parenthetical between one and two, subtract that from the area of lot two, and you'll get 2593. Now that's the important one between two and three. Because if you start to have some angle points in this section, that's going to affect the proportioning of the center north 1 16th. And that's important because if you, depending on the angle points and the dimensions going around the section, and mind you, you've got a perfect section here by the 1881 survey, but how many times are you going to find that on the ground, folks? So let's just assume you found all the corners. You know you're going to have angle points at every quarter corner, right? So that's just what we live with. So then you go ahead and you take the 2593, which is the parenthetical distance between two and three, subtract that for the area in uh, government lot three, and you'll get 2561 chains. And then you go ahead and subtract that 2561 from the area of lot four, you get 2528. And gee golly, that's what you've got here. So it all worked out right. And so, uh, as I mentioned, here's the math for it for section three going all the way down through. So if you want to see the physical math, you've got it. Well, let's go to five. Shouldn't be any different. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this case. Hey, one second. Yeah, I was going to say one second. Schroeder had uh, his hand up for a minute. And then also... Oh, I'm sorry. That's Go okay. Ahead, no. And then also for those uh, on Zoom, I threw a copy of Steve's presentation in the chat box. And there's a link to the uh, to his uh, presentation in the Dropbox folder. So you can save those down and then kind of follow along if you want. So there you go. Go for it, Shorter. Okay. Well, yeah, I, well, I just can't imagine surveying on the ground of Township in seven days. But uh, these boys were rolling if they have six chains closing up to the top. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm used to links, not chains. That's, that's, I'll shut up. <laughs> well, um, Mike, um, we have found through experience and, and looking at the notes carefully sometimes that sometimes these old GLO crews um, join together on their contracts. I got a batch of them down in central Nevada that there were two surveyors there and they were leapfrogging. One surveyor would take one tier, the next one would take the next tier on the same day. <laughs> and that all came out when you read carefully in the notes where they signed it and what they did and the date they did it. Anything goes with all those old tricksters, I'll tell you. And our challenge is just trying to figure it out. And I'll tell you, I've lost sleep every time I had to proportion a corner in, especially when it was in an area that I didn't have a good reason to see it gone. But I'll try not to get off on too many uh, side trails there. So the same thing here, you've got uh, 8372 and again 8184. So it's uh, again decreasing from east to west. And it's the same process. And uh, your 2372 subtracted from the area of one and right on down. And again, 2278 is your most important one between number uh, two and three lots. So there's really no difference there on that one. Here again, here's all of your data uh, to be able to walk yourself through. Okay, now, Section six is always a fun one only because in calculating the parentheticals, calculate one, two, and three, and then jump down and calculate seven, six, and five. And I like to put it bluntly that lot number four takes it in the butt. Uh, you, you seldom ever get the same area here on lot number four 
that uh, I, that they show on their plats, okay? And um, so again here, lot one, which is uh, 2184 for the east side and subtracted from the area gives you 2138 for one and two. And then of course, the most important one, 2092 for the parenthetical two and three. And you can go ahead and calculate the one between three and four because you're going to need that later just to do the math. And in this case, you're going to be using 2144, the east side of lot four, meaned with the west side, which is 20. So the mean of 2024 plus 20 times the mean of your parenthetical between five and four coming from the south heading north and the distance on the north side of four, which is going to be 2294. So you can see in calculating the area by meaning out east, west, and north, south, that's how you come up with a calculated area that will seldom be what's reflected in the, uh, on the plot. So again, here we go from, uh, from east to west, lots one, two, three. Then we jump down here on the west side and we start down there and we then go uh, from uh, government lot seven, then six, then five and up to five and four. So it's all the same math, and I broke that down again here in section six. Here's lots one through four and all the math for it. Here's lots four through seven, working up from seven up to four, working here from one over the four. And then you result in parentheticals. Now, the only difference is once you get on the westerly side, Again, you're going to be doing the same thing, lots one, two, three, and four. Now, this is just one of the three processes. And when you start having angle points, when you start having one side of a section versus the other with one odd link instead of both of them being even or both of them being odd, then sometimes you can't come up with um, the same parenthetical, uh, particularly for either the center north or in this case, the center west 116th here. Uh, and you won't be able to come up with the uh, same data on all three processes. So you just take um, the majority. And uh, many times you're going to have to round up or down, and especially if you get out to the um, to the thousandth, and um, just pay attention to which way it rounds up or down by you know half a link or something of that nature. So um, it isn't a perfect system, but remember too, their closures was pretty loose back then, and. Um, let me grab a sheet of paper just that I just found again the other day, sitting over here on top of a desk. I had a little summary here that I put together years ago. And um, it used to be that until uh, let's say the 73 manual was one in 1280, which meant that you had 25 links per section. The 1947 was one in 640. The 1930 manual was one in 640. But then after that, uh, the manual of uh, 1902 and before that, uh, it was much looser. You had mostly 50 links that you played with um in north and south directions and the 73 manual one in 1280 during the 1980s they came out with an interim memorandum in the department of interior and they called that out as one in five thousand 
but anybody know what is the standard now in the 2009 manual? It's one in 4,000. So they kind of backed off a little from an interim memorandum that they had. So when you're trying to figure out distances and so forth, particularly when you're retracing a, uh, a more modern BLM survey, everything from the 1950s on up or so, keep in mind which manual they were working under and when you can't close because of convergency and different things that the private party probably isn't applying very often, don't get bothered with uh, not closing perfect. We, uh, we're not sitting here in a uh, X, Y perfect square. There is no such thing as that in the uh, general land office BLM system because of the convergency. So uh, I have had a number of phone calls when I was chief uh, saying, how come your sections don't close down here in Las Vegas? And <laughs> had to go into a little explanation of what it was all about. Two okay. things. Two things. Uh -huh. uh, Steve, um, one, will you send me your little, that little note that you said, will you scan that and send it to me? And then I'll throw it in as a follow-up as well. And then, oh, okay. Uh, yep. And yeah, then, I, uh, can, I can just scan this little sheet and do that. Perfect. 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 And then uh, Schroeder's got another comment. Right. Well, well, I'm glad you covered the accuracy standards, but I think uh, see if this if you agree with this, Steve. So those last closing distances when they came up, you know, they started all at 80s on the south, and they got they show 80s going up the east and west side of the township. It's going to give you a clue. Uh, how those boys were doing. I mean, if they, if you're back in the rest of that township, I mean, I think just by looking at the, at their closing distances uh, on these lots on the north and west here could give you an idea about your search radius. So uh, if you're looking for something else out in the middle there, because, well, again, the seven days tells you a hint, but, um, yeah, they're they're not geometrically correct, right? There's a whole bunch of survey in, in here other than convergence. And the closer you get to your home state up there, buddy, the, the more convergence there is. <laughs> Makes a lot of difference. Hmm. Oops, where did I go here? A little bit too quick. Uh, yeah, slide uh, to the slide here, 13. Here, here we go. Okay, so this one is um, adding the adjacent lot areas in a typical lot of section and divide by four. So that's a rather straightforward one too. So let's take a look at what we're talking about here. So what we've got is these are the calculations from the first process. So I wanna show you how they relate. Here we have the north side of section three again with the various lottings. So what this process is, add lot one and lot two area together, divide it by four, and you'll end up with 26, 25, 25. Well, the other process we just used is 26.25. So, okay, that would round down okay. And then you go ahead and uh, you add up the areas of lot two and lot three, add them together right here, 103.72 divided by four. Guess what you get, 2593? Hmm, 2593, same thing. So as I say, this is a check when you run into some problems and they're a little bit off one way or another. And then likewise, for all that matters, you go ahead and add lot three and lot four areas together down here, 102.43 divided by four. And again, you got a, a, a number carried out a little bit further, 25.6075. And here we have 25.61. Well, it's easy to see 0.7 or 75 could be rounded up. So um, that's easy enough. 
and it's just a verification of two processes that come together. But the math involved in it, um, of course, gives you a number carried out a little bit further. I use for myself the standard that I, I let things just fall into place, however many places that it comes out in the math, I round out at the last to whatever increment that we're using. You'll find on more modern surveys with the BLM that you'll find uh, three place uh, chains and so forth, you know, 27.245, things of that nature. And um, that's become, I think, more necessary because of the value of the land that they're purchasing, they're selling or whatever. And you get down in the middle of um, Las Vegas or you get on the shoreline of Lake Tahoe. And land is worth just a little bit more per square foot than it is out in the wild parts of, uh, you know, of where most of us do a lot of our survey work. Okay, so then again, same thing here, lot number five or section number five. I won't bore you with going through exactly the same process, but we can see from here that you've uh, you've got your east boundary, and then you in this case here, when you subtract a two, it's an even number. Twenty three twenty five comes up twenty three twenty five. Your twenty two seventy eight is the same, and your twenty two thirty one is the same. So um, that one came out real easy because uh, uh, you know is a even number to uh, division by four. Um, has produced for you. It is five. Okay, here again, six. I've split six into two pieces here for you. And uh, what I've done is on six, I've gone to the 2184 is the distance parenthetical for the east side of government lot one. But if we go ahead and add the two areas together, divide by four, we'll get 2138. And that's what was calculated by the first process, 2138, it tracks. And down here now, round up or down, depending on um, the other solutions, I end up with 2092 here. And so that still tracks. And uh, this process will not work for lots three and four or four and five in section six. So um, in this case, lots three and four, if you mean those two together, uh, it's not going to give you a good number for the distance between lot three and four. But if you use the other processes where you're taking the east boundary of one, subtracting it from the area, then subtract that result from the area of lot two, subtract that result from the area of lot three, will give you what they probably use to calculate the west side of government lot three. But it may or may not work then when you're resolving four. In the same way, when you get down here to uh, government lots number seven, six, and five, work from the bottom up. Don't try to go from lot four down because it's not going to work. So as you can see here, we've got that lower half. And, and again, between lot six and seven, 2042, that works. And then between lots five and six, the important one, there again, 2126, and that works. So other than playing around with government lot number four, it still comes together with a, a good um, relationship to those two processes. Now, there's another one that is a check. And that is taking the difference from the east to the west side of the northern tiers 
for uh, the same as the distance from the north and the south side of the westerly tier. Take the difference in the distances of those uh, lots and divide it by four and then add or subtract appropriately as you go from side to side. So let's get back to number three. Let's go down and show you and uh, please excuse just some of my handwriting in here as it was just a lot quicker to, to um, work around this today. So here we are, government lot three. So what we want to do is 2658, which is the easterly side of lot one, 2528, which is the distance along the eastern, westerly side of lot four. Subtract those two from each other and you get a distance difference of 1.30 chains. Divide that by four, you get 0.325. So now then take the 2658 east side of lot one and you're descending in uh, size of the lots from east to west. So you subtract 0.325, you get 26.255. Well, here again is the other two calculations, 26.25. Well, it's easy enough to decide here, 26.255. You could go up, you could go down, but it's within reason. And then again, you take the 25.93. Uh, yes, here, here, okay, 26.255 minus uh, 325 gives you 2593, then subtract the 0. 0.325 again, gives you 25.605. And you can take a look at the 2593, the important one, right on it hit. And then you're down to the parentheticals that many times don't even matter. But just by way of uh, calculation, you end up then with a uh, 25.605. In this case, you round the five up and you get the 25.61. So you're not that far off, especially considering how they calculated these things way back when in their offices. And again, section five, I bring it up. There's the worksheet on it. Oops. Yeah. Okay, there's, there's five, there's the same worksheet, same process, already went through one, no use boring you on that one. We all have a little more work to do when we get to uh, 18, uh, section 18 down in Vegas. And again, here's six. Now I've gone ahead and broke six into two slides for the northerly tier of lots, one through four. And uh, you can do the comparisons, but here's where I found, after doing some work with it, what I think is a draftsman's error. Things don't work out with 4136 up here. Actually, uh, the parentheticals in here, uh, one turns out to be 20.44 by the time you get to here. And it actually should be 24.46. And that's because this should be 41.38. It just takes a little analysis of what was going on. And let's see if I can come down to the slide I was looking at that, or I noted that again, that I make that slide up and then not insert it. Yeah, here. Um, note that in lot three, the plat drafting has an error and it should be 4138 to be able to work with the calculations from east to west to get to government lot number three. So it's my belief after analyzing this and working with these um, parentheticals 
in the proper manner and using the same processes as before that 41.38 is what should be on that original plat. It is not uncommon to have graphical errors by the persons in the office is drawing up these plats. Uh, that's a whole new lecture and a different workshop that I pre pre presented. Uh, thanks to Ron Schurler, actually. Ron had been preparing one for, C for uh, CFEDS that he never got around to presenting formally, and he left it up to me. And uh, I'll tell you, when you develop your own work, it goes reasonably well. When you jump in and just take somebody else's and the way they put it together, it doesn't always go so well. And I really stumbled. I was embarrassed as can be presenting that one of his, but it's full of good information. And it's uh, irregularities, it's called irregularities within the uh, public land survey system plats and notes. Um, I want to make one bold statement because I've run into it so many times where somebody has come to me and asked a question only to find out the only thing they had in their hands was a plat. The plat and its associated notes is an absolute handshake. Don't go to the field. Don't start your project analysis without both of those in hand and make sure you get all the notes and plats don't doubt guess and think, well, you know, it. what do I need all these extra ones for? There might be something hidden there that they did in the supplemental plat later. And if we have time at the end of this, I'll just show you a few of the other things happening in this particular in the township down in Las Vegas. So here again, uh, lot six or government section six, and then just down to seven, uh, same process. I'm not going to bore you with it. But here again, it's just uh, adding two of the areas together, divide by four, compare it to what you've had. You're going to find this all comes out nicely. 1962, there you are, the key one. And here you are, 1960. And again, 1966 uh, down here on the south line south border of law four okay hey, uh, this date any particular question before we leave the the there, simple ones there is a great one in the chat that is very loaded <laughs> uh -oh. what kind hey, of let me look at the chat which uh, one is the it's from will uh what kind of weight does a parenthetical distance hold during a boundary dispute when natural monuments are in the ground and referred to in a legal description. <laughs> okay, let me think about that one a minute again. And a weight is apparent there. Well, I'm just going to stick <laughs> my neck out. The parent, the, um, first, I'm going to say if there is no federal land involved, <laughs> you got an easy out if you can get the landowners to agree to whatever the monumentation is. Okay, fair enough. Even though their legal description may be by aliquot part and and actually uh, go all the way back to you know the original patent. Now, if there is federal land involved, the parentheticals and the accurate calculations of them, and then the use of those in the subdivision of the section or quarter section or whatever becomes very important because you are dealing up against a federal land, whether that federal land is a um, Forest Service land, BIA, reclamation, if it's uh, controlled by feds and let me throw another caveat if it is public domain that has never been in private ownership 
So I say that because there's a lot of federal lands that have been purchased, they've been acquired. And when the feds acquire lands, usually boundaries come along with it that was um, established between the parties. The feds don't have the right to interfere with the prior rights and um, uh, bona fide rights of the landowners. And I've been involved in several cases that they just overlooked the situation that the land was bought by the government. So uh, you have to keep all those little things in mind as you uh, go through. So whether or not that's just an old government cop out on that particular question there, Will, or not, but uh, hopefully it uh, it satisfies you. There you go. Uh, Schroeder has a comment, and then um, there's another one in the chat that give it. Uh, yeah, good more. explanation, Steve. Yeah. And yeah, so you have to look at the source of law, as Bob Dahl would say, if it's required lands by the federal government, then all the, the state laws apply in the time that it was non-federal before it was before it was reacquired. But you, you, I know you've run across this, a lot of people have. So the original patent comes out, you got government lot four, lot uh, section six, and then some, some wise uh, uh, title or attorney or somebody redescribes that as the Northwest of the Northwest section. Oh six. yeah. <laughs> what do you do with that? You know, yeah. you go back to, uh, we go back to what the, what the title was and what the intent was was just somebody not educated in the public land survey system to change the description of that land in title. And that's where it's so important too, to make sure that you have all of the most update supplemental plats, because many times when they start supplementing things, they'll go ahead and get into a government lot and they'll supplement it, say, uh, let's go back to one of these up here, uh, just a second. Okay. Let me reduce this. They're going to break down government lot number one. And so you'll end up then with a um, 20 acres and then the remainder up here, but this will no longer be called government lot number one. It will then be government lot number five up here because you already used one, two, three, four. So if they only break down government lot number one, one goes away and the northerly portion uh, which is uh, put up there at 20 chain and accessor deficiency that becomes government lot number five and if you have missed a supplemental plat someplace along the line for some administrative purpose then you can still get in trouble you know what is what is the north half and the south half of government lot number one <laughs> yeah so uh, you got to be real careful. There's a there's a whole lot to think about and pursue. Okay, so One, there was down here in the chat. There was yeah, a, they were going to unmute themselves. It just comes up as iPhone. So if you want to unmute yourself, you can uh, ask the question oh. real quick. I, I have a question. Um, this is uh, this is summer. I, this is really interesting. Um, it's so it's like preparation, but also. Um, so we have issues with like rights of way taking, right? Um, and it's not federal, but it's public, right? And their records are no good. And so we essentially are piecing together the planet, trying to understand where effectively there, there's an error. And what we might be facing is a fellow surveyor that is hanging their hat on the one record that we're contesting as, as like th that there's actually error in that one record and it can put us in a massive over overlap um so kind of a reverse order question i guess i'm trying to figure out how to how to poise this is if we don't have our hands on these records but we have our hands on everything that supports our findings that suggests that there might be an error in, in this certain record. Um, how, how do y'all typically approach that? Because again, 
the say the other survey, and I'm just kind of throwing an example. The other surveyor is saying we're hinging our entire determination on this one record, and we're hinging our entire determination on that one record being absolutely and unequivocally in error. Does that make, does that make sense? As a question, I know that was uh, if, if I'm reading you right. Um... The first approach is to do all of your analysis, make sure that you've calculated what you intend to show. And I'm assuming you're bordering up against some federal land. And at that point, I would say get a hold of the federal agency that you're bordering up against. Don't walk into them, particularly the BLM, don't walk in and say, okay, how do I do this? Here's all my data, because they're not going to just sit down and tell you how to do it. They will entertain your proposal or the proposal also of the opponent, you might say, that doesn't agree with what you've got. And they will opine on what you're doing but they're going to use a caveat that says if they get involved in an actual government survey and they find something different than what you have, then, you know, they're going to abide by their decision. At that point, the thing you want to be careful of doing is if you, if you go too far with the court, the private courts in litigation, you are closing the opportunity to work with the Interior Board of Land Appeals. Mm. And the Interior Board of Land Appeals is a sounding board for cadastral surveys on any government agency. And uh, they will hear it, but they will usually deny an appeal or a, a plea to the IBLA if you're already deep in litigation. Then if the IBLA doesn't give you an answer satisfactory to you, you can still then go to federal authority, but you're going to end up in a federal court. So mm -hmm. it's not going to be some local judge making a decision for you. And particularly, I dealt with dozens and dozens of attorneys in many, many court cases. And... Um, they like to win, let's <laughs> just put it that way. And not all of them have a good sense of boundary law and everything entailed in it. So whether or not that's offbeat from where you were going, I'm not sure, but. Uh, no, it's very helpful and put the fear of God in me, actually. Um, <laughs> but uh, is there a comfort like boundary line agreements that is somewhere in the middle if we can't if, if we're trying to keep it out of 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 that 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 you know sort of trajectory of of, of and a legal boundary, a boundary line agreement between the feds and its adjoiners is not an easy thing to do uh, i'll be very truthful with you and uh, it depends on the circumstances. The U.S. Forest Service has their Small Tracks Act, but there's a lot of caveats with their Small Tracks Act. And uh, there are a number of laws out there. Um, the BLM, they'll get involved with the Trust for Public Lands, where if you are encroaching on, first off, uh, let's assume that you're encroaching on what the feds think is a piece of federal land. And secondly, you have to admit that you're encroached. Then you can maybe do some land exchanges where mm. you find some land that the feds want to buy, and they'll exchange that sometimes for the area that you're encroached. But that encroachment has to be significant not just a fence line and a garden over the line. It's got to be some significant stuff before they start dealing with you. They are absolutely a case-by-case -case situation. They take a long time, uh, many months, by the time it goes through all the um, 
various branches and the reviews that is within the government. Thank you. Yeah, that helps a lot. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. Let me... Okay. Here you got a few lots, don't you? <laughs> Just, uh <-huh>. a <laughs> Just a few. <laughs> Just a few. What we're going to do here is we're going to uh, show the beginning of where you need to go to resolve something like this. I counted at one time how many actual documents is in this township 22 South 61 East of survey nature. I haven't included them all because a lot of them were remote to this section 18, but um, you never know what gem is out there. And in, in, in a few minutes when we get to the end of this, I'll show you just some additional ones that uh, could affect even section 18 if you, uh, because this sec this section could be broke down even further, as you can see. You could lock the whole Marianne here. So here we go again, uh, 1881, Brunton Proctor, July 20 through 26, a seven day wonder. And there's all of your um, acreages again, according to original. So we're going to be dealing with government section 18. Now, one of the first challenges you hit many times, and there's not much relief to uh, figure out these areas other than what's on the plat. So 3551 is fairly easy to read, but sometimes they blend together in that 51. If it's a little more blurry, is that a 51 or a 57? Is this a three or a five? But this is pretty plain to me. 3672, 3592. Hmm. There's some kind of liquid been spilled on this original plat, and that's as good as it gets. So who would guess looking at that? What is that? 36 point what? Anybody want to like yell out what they think it 36. is? 36.12. Yeah, good guess. 36.13. Yep, it turns out that it is a 36.13. And you, you know, you look close, you can zoom in, do all sorts of things. It just pixelates when you zoom in too far. Sometimes being back a little further will help. But this is good, as good as it gets. This is an original scan or a scan of an original plat. So you've got no place to go but the plat. And that can cause a little bit of difference here and there if you guess wrong by, you know, one or two. Um, hundreds of an acre or so, but um, all you can do is just do your best with it. Oops, where are we, there, where, where, where we are. So, these are 1881, all right? So, the next important plat in this particular township was November 6 of 1956, wherein appears a dependent resurvey of certain sections within that township, including section 18. Now, I've already compared and it runs consistent. The bearings and distances around this dependent resurvey are carried through on all the documents that come hereafter. There's no changes, so they, they uh, relate back. So you want to get the first dependent resurvey and then any subsequent so don't just take the last one and uh, assume that something else um, hasn't happened before that now in this case you can see that uh, none of these sections have been subdivided right and this particular one is sheet one of three sheets and here's sheet number two and look at the difference all of a sudden. Sheet number two, they've all of a sudden lauded the far westerly side of this southwest quadrant of section 18. 
you'll find the bearings and distances on the outside will be consistent with the bearings and distances on the dependent resurvey of 1956. And this plat, sheet number two, and then sheet number three, they're all part of this November 6, 1956 survey, part and parcel. And you can see where they've gone ahead on the westerly side of, of these um, lotted sections on the west side of this township. And they've started lotting all of these. Now, you notice, too, with all these odd bearings and distances, how is it they can come out with an even 20, 20, 20, 20? Well, it's um, just uh, they're not allowed to change the areas on private land for one thing, but they're also not allowed to show areas um, of private land has been changed. So this is still in federal ownership for now of, to be patented out later. Okay, so there is sheets number one, number two, number three. So all of a sudden, a little bit later, May 23rd, 1958, they have subdivision of sections. Well, that looks familiar, doesn't it? It was this particular plat. Now they're coming down here a couple of years later. And they've gone in and they've subdivided every one of those. So you now have center quarters, and that's is okay. Some of them here. Look at section thirty, and you'll see that. Well, let's go down to the next one here. You'll see that you also have some sixteenths set, and lo and behold, there's our subject section eighteen. So in in my in a approved survey of May 23, 1958. They came in and subdivided section 18, and they went ahead and set the center quarter, the center north, center east, center south, and center west 1 16th. Now you can take a look here. You'll see that the center north, center east, center south, that's a split, right? As it should be. So here again, you've got an angle point over here. You've got a straight line up here. It's all 89 degrees southwest. You've got another angle point on the south side. So that is going to you know, affect the areas in these particular quadrants. But in referring to the areas, and I'll show you at the end of this discussion on section 18, the only place where you find those areas, and many of you might not think about going to that source. So here's our section 18 now with corners all the way around it, uh, but you don't have 16th on the exterior except on the westerly side. They also set the 16th at equidistant along the west tier west side of section 18, excuse me. Okay, so enter our supplemental plat. Look at the date, August 21, 1961. That's after the 1956 and the 1958 surveys. So they're just merely going in and they're using all of the same data. Let's just blow this up a little. They're using all of the same bearings and distances on the exterior that was generated from the first 1956 dependent resurvey. They've maintained that. So all of a sudden now they've got the lots here. And what we're going to do is we're going to get down to trying to figure out what you would do to survey lots 7 down through 26 here, 7, 8, 13, 14, 19, 20, 25, and 26. And you notice there's no areas any place around the southerly half altogether. No areas even in that block of lots on the far westerly side of the southwest quarter of section 18. But if you'll take a look at all these lots, 1.25 acre, 1.25 acre, every one of these, and how can it be perfect 1.25 
with this kind of a difference in the distance. So they're just sticking to a nominal relationship to the original plat. So you get here, however, to the far westerly tier, and there you are, 1.55, 1.54, 351 and so forth, 1.46. So here is the first indication that they've shown some areas. Why they didn't show areas down here, I can't really give you the answer right now. Um, I could research it further, ask a few questions, and uh, maybe find out, but I'm not sure why they didn't present areas in any of these at that time. Okay, so here's our section 18 we're dealing with again. Let's take a look. I just did a little hand work again on here to show you how I was uh, figuring out the parenthetical. What's important here, first off, in the breakdown of the southwest quadrant, where we have these odd lots along the far west side, is what is the center west 1 16th? How is that proportioned in? If you work your way all the way back with these distances they're using, you'll see that these are proportioned in. And uh, you can see here at 8082 from the east to the west quarter that it's long. And actually, it's uh, long here, but it's not exactly what the record was. But here's the proportion of the mount. This normally would be 20 chains in the original. And it's 2070 because it's long. That's at the proportionate portion of that 8082. So here again, my most important one to figure out is the parenthetical between government lots number two and number three. So I've done a couple of things here and I'll blow this up a little bit more. I'm gonna blow up the north half and then the south half so you can read it just a little bit better. Okay, so here's the north half. 78.12 means then that I have um, 18.12 for the northerly line of government lot number one. So 3613, the area of that lot, minus 1812 gives me 1801 for the parenthetical between one and two for all it matters. It really doesn't matter here, but just calculating it. Just as a comparison, adding 36, uh, 13 to 3592, dividing that by four gives 18.0125. Okay, 1801, 18.0125, basically the same. So now let's go down to the parenthetical here. If we um, take then the 1801, Subtract that from the 3592 area, we end up with 1791. So that's my key parenthetical. And uh, the one that I would be using now, mind you, you get back to this 1958 survey here. And uh, even though they show all these monuments, it behooves you to find them on the ground and hopefully either the original or a decent perpetuation of them, be careful what you're using. And you're gonna come up with some differences in your bearings and distances from what is on this plat. The equipment they used, the closure they had back then, you gotta consider that. But first off, uh, are you occupying the positions of the monuments as set in this original dependent resurvey? Really important in your actual application. So let's just, we've already found this then to be 1791. Let's take a look at the lower half and follow this through. So again, 
we now go ahead and take the 1791, subtract it from the 36, uh, 35. See, here's one of those that's easy to look at and think that's a six, but it's a 35. And, um, you know, when you stand back and look, at first it looks like a six, but if you look up, you can see a 35 planer here, and here's a plain 35, and you know that the 36 wouldn't fit in the middle of that. So that helps you decide that this is not a six, but it's a five. Be careful in looking at those uh, sometimes blurry and otherwise damaged pieces of information on a plat. So here again, 3572 minus 1791 gives us the 1781. If you take the two areas, add them together, divide them by four, you end up with 17.8075. Eh, it's easy enough to call it 1781, isn't it? And then go ahead and follow through. Again, now take the 1781 parenthetical between Four, three and four, and subtract it from the 3551, we end up with 1770. Hmm, 7770 over here. It all works out, doesn't it, at the end? It's like running a traverse and leaving the last leg open. You don't want to do that. You want to close your work, even in these calculations, because if you don't come up with what you should be coming up with here, and you've maybe made some major error getting to that spot. So continue through on your math processes to see that you end up with what you're supposed to end up on the north, south, or the east, west of these lauded sections. Does that make sense? Oops, going a little fast there. Okay, that's that lower one. Um, here now, just for comparison of area to show what they were uh, doing, you had 623.28 acres in that original, on that original plat, 160, 160, 80, 80, and then the lottings. Now, if you add up all of the areas on the original plat, the 80, the 36, 72, 35, 72. So easy to sit back and look at that as a six in the 35, 72, 35, 71. You have 151.23 acres. Well, so what? You have 152.05 acres up here. Original area by adding everything up on the original plat. So let's go down here and take a look. When you add those two areas together from the original, along with 160, 160, it all adds up to 62326. Record was 62328. So you can see that when the office was calculating all of these lottings and so forth and assigning some areas to them, their intent was to make sure that what they did here added up to the original acreage. Remember, it's just a supplemental plan. So where are these BLM areas? Where the heck do they come from? I went through and just for the heck of it, I went ahead and I calculated based on 3.015 up here, the parenthetical on the north side of lot seven. And this is a straight line. And the 2.88, I went ahead and I calculated by uh, subtracting one from the other, dividing it by eight and adding it going through. And these are the areas I ended up with, 151, 150, 149, 148. None of them match what they show on the next slide. So what is that magical slide? That magical slide is the master title plat. 
So as you can see, this is your section 18. This is the center right here. And this is the Southwest 116th. So we're dealing with the lots that run all the way down seven down through 26 down here. And look at what I was trying to demonstrate. All of these with things written in them have patented out. And some of the others may have patented, looks like, yeah, it looks like most of them have patented ditches and canals and sometimes minerals have been retained. So it looks like that they have pretty much patented out everything in there. Now, what apparently to this date hasn't been patented out, all, all these little quote unquote 1.25 acre alloca parts, they haven't been patented yet. So each one of those little alloca parts there, people may have gone out and tried to put pins on the ground or some surveyor has come in and measured what I call the 1320 club. They take off from the nearest corner that they can find of GLO. They measure in, you know, uh, five chains, five chains, five chains, and then set a point. And then the feds come by and they um, want to start identifying what lands are isolated federal lands in between these private lands. And I had an entire project just out of Reno that had a situation just like this. And oh, I had fun. I involved about every private surveyor in that valley and um, a lot of encroachments going on because the 1320 club was very popular back in the 50s. So, um, and I think most of you might know what that is. So all of a sudden, here are the areas on the master title plat that are given by the public room and the folks that calculate these master title plats. And if you haven't gathered all the records, including the master title plat and the historical indexes, particularly those last two, you've left yourself open to some potential problems in the future. All right, before we go to a final wrap up here, or just a few things I wanna show you. Um, any other significant questions? Have I made any sense? Have I confused the heck out of you? Have I left you with enough information to go back and review? I know uh, Schroeder's got his hand up too. I Great stuff so far. I love it. Um, well, you know this, Steve. Master title plot is not an official survey record. And if the if the realty group conveyed land off of what some yep. draftsman put on an MTP, I couldn't defend that as, as a surveyor at IBLA or in court. So I don't know if I would use those areas on a, an MTP of, I mean, unless there was a gross error. Yeah, that was my point there is those areas don't really mean anything. They are there to satisfy the total area within that 1881 section 18. And yeah, I, 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 I'd have raised heck with the MTP group if they put areas on that was not something of official record. Exactly. So, uh, but I did this just for the display of where they came from. And if people try to use these areas, that's not going to work in trying to identify, say, somebody has bought government lot number seven there. Um, be careful, be aware. Yeah. And here again, monuments on the ground, the quality. Um, you know, do they, do they go back to the original location? Or are they in the right place? Or are they the right monuments? That's where it's all at anyway, for the surveyor. Yeah. Well, yeah, and that's exactly right. So the official records, the plots and field notes and monuments on the ground. So just for the audience, I mean, MTP is a cartoon. It's, its whole purpose mm -hmm. is to show title sequence of out of federal ownership or current federal ownership status. So don't give it the same weight as an official survey record. And the HI, of course, is a historical 
a record of uh, when the land went out from patent, and after that, they don't track it any further, right, Mike? Absolutely. So that's your that's your first out of federal, or it could be reacquired back out. But anyway, yes, uh, historical index gives you the history of that federal land of uh, its original public domain to first patent, and then anything that gets reacquired. But again, it's it's just a cartoon to show the sequence. I mean, I've even seen people try to take the graphics and lay it over you know, surveys and have some dispute. It's just, it's a, it's a key point that it's a, it's a uh, record of chain of title, not a survey record. Right. <clears throat> Did I ask a question? Hey, I'm sorry. No, go for it somewhere. If it, okay, so, um, so that's, that's an ongoing dispute over, like over here is, is like, you know, is it the original, which is, the, I guess the plan versus the laid out, and we can't figure out where something goes wrong along the way, right? And monumentation is is all over the place, right? So the at what point? I guess here do do you do you fall back on the 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 intended versus the actual? If that question makes makes sense because i've always fallen back fallen back on the original yeah you but, get back to the vesting title right but how it's laid out doesn't follow how it was planned let's say um the monument the monuments don't line up so that's that's where we get we're trying to say the Barrington distances that you find between the monuments, and we're assuming the monuments are the original. Yes. They do not uh, coincide with what's in the original document. Now, if it's a government aliquot part, it is what it yep. is. An aliquot part description doesn't have dimensions with it until you re go back to the plat and the notes. That's where, that's where you get your dimensions. But I've seen many, many attorneys and other related, uh, hopefully I'm not stepping on any toes here with anybody with attorneys that uh, rewrite some of those, even the, the government descriptions and so forth. And- um, Oh, I, yeah, that happens all yeah. the time. But but that they it, it, this is not an aliquot situation, but- it's a subsequent, you know, plot where it's it, so it's like, are we so our our issues are are we trying to go back and reconcile what was done in error? Yeah, it's the best you can do if, if you can figure out where those errors are at. And again, and, try to get some some help from local agencies, particularly the BLM. Uh, because even Forest Service doesn't have federal authority, but any Interior Department, well, only Cadastro within the BLM has the actual federal authority to interpret and dependently resurvey and, um, you know, oversee the public lands. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, yeah, that helps a lot. Thank you. Yep. Okay, let's yep. just... Uh, yeah, one more, uh, one more. George has got his hand up there. He wants to chime in. Okay, go for it, George. Hey, good to see you. <laughs> it's Lyndon. Smith. Hey, George, how are you doing? I am well. Good. I'm well, and you're you're looking good too. Well, I'm still standing up on two. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm trying to do as well. Hey, I would my my comment would be using the MTP as your basis for your survey or as a, a reliable source for your survey would be like using an assessor staff. It's just not going to happen. No, it, no, it's just not good sense. It's like you say. It, it's uh, like like Mike says. It's kind of a cartoon, and um, sometimes some of the folks within our BLM offices take a little privilege of putting some data on those MTPs that 
shouldn't be there calculated the way they do and possibly misleading some people. But it's still a good tool to reference and see particularly ownership and things of that nature. I I always grab the MTPs for any survey I'm doing uh, that involves any federal land. Well, it could sure get you pointed in a direction to start from, at least where that land came out. Yeah. But beyond yeah. that, yeah, cartoon. <laughs> As yeah. a cadastro chief, the first thing I did when I got a survey request was look at the MTP to see if there was a federal interest. But, mm -hmm. and, and, and without rabbit trailing too much, so in our state, it was chaos of what they were doing over there with that. And so I, they swept it under cadastral under my supervision. So I, I had to give it the, yeah, it's, your change is ready. And I had staff to do that. And then, you know, reorganization. And it went over the lands of reality because it's, well, you're holding all this stuff up. We can't, you know, we've got to get these MTPs, you know, updated. But, you know, my point was, well, it's got to be right. It's got to be based on the survey record. And yeah. if you don't have a surveyor that's working with your MTP group, danger, Will Robinson, hang on. It's just a cartoon. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you all for being patient to this point. Let me just take about five more minutes or less. So here we are dealing with the same township down there. So you can see what they've done here. They've gone ahead in that big void in between the earlier surveys in 1953 here. They have a dependent resurvey and a subdivision of section, seven sheets to this. So this one here shows you the different sections and shows how they were breaking them down. Let's just take a, a quick look at... Um, the sheets as we go down here. There's one of the sheets. Oh, wow. Look at all those lots. So it doesn't get any easier down there, folks. There's sheet number three. Sheet number four. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, beware. Beware. Sheet number five. Sheet number six. Look at that easterly half, westerly half of section 28, would you? And sheet number seven. And then, of course, you truly even got involved. And in, uh, when I was a uh, chief down there, and here's my JSP. And so here's section 26, which we looked at uh, when these, where did we have 26 up here? I think we had it in one of these. Maybe, okay, maybe not. 26 then we had to be broke down again further. And this was because of some sort of a utility line or roadway. I can't quite read what's there. And here again, now you've got government lot number one, government lot number three, government lot number two. So you, again, here we are in 1994. So there's another record breaking something down there. If you entered section 26 without going into the BLM and pulling down these flats and the associated notes. This is a dependent resurvey and subdivision and it has a set of notes with it. And then here we are as late, good old Bob Scruggs when he was in there in 2003. This is a supplemental flat of the Northwest quarter of the Northwest quarter of the Northwest quarter of second 16. Mm -hmm. So uh, what are these? Uh, yeah, lots 18 and so forth. So yeah. Get all the records, folks. That's all I can advise you at the end of the day here. Thank you for your patience and participation. And again, um, hopefully it will be useful to some of you and maybe a little bit for all of you. <laughs> so much good information. I love that. Anybody, uh, anybody have specific questions? There's Lots of uh, lots of stuff going on there, but nobody. Very oh. very much gratitude. Thank you. Yeah, good stuff. Uh, go All for right. sure. You're more than welcome. It, it's trans. So yeah, I always do this when I come in, <laughs> especially with somebody as 
friggin' knowledgeable as Steve Parrish is. Exactly. But uh, it's, when we had all of our cadastral chief gathering, you know, Dominica was had a request to all of us. You know, there's a lot of boundary evidence standards, uh, certificate requirements that the Bureau just can't handle with staffing. And I have a really good series of presentations. I, I'll volunteer to do it on Mentoring Mondays. But one of the most key ones, and it's the first one you do is a chain of survey records. It's like a chain of title. It goes right into what Steve was saying. It's like, you got to gather all this stuff. I had a real, everybody gave Dan Webb a hard time because we were trying to look for corners around where we were staying out there in Utah. And he <laughs> had like three records out of probably 14 that was needed, you know. We found the corners, but, you know, there's a whole bunch of gray hairs. But anyway, those uh, boundary evidence standards, uh, CFEDs can, um, if you're a CFEDs, you can do it. And that's what I'm thinking that Dominica needs to do. So I'd be glad to do a presentation of what they are. This is a refresher if you are a CFEDs and then the private surveyors too. It's something less than a full official cadastral survey. Um, it'd be the, the, the chain of surveys or uh, a land description review or go on the ground and do a, you know, a boundary evaluation with those records in hand or boundary assurance certificate for some federal agency that they just want to know, you know, are there corners out there? Where's our federal boundaries? And if you find all of the evidence, you can certify that here's the federal boundary and you don't need an official survey to do a dependent resurvey and show you a plat, which takes a lot of time. So it's an interesting topic and uh, you and I can get together and figure out a schedule time that works to be awesome. to do that. Heck yeah, that'd be awesome. Uh, Connie says she's retracing a survey in Mono County, which uh, Mr. Parrish was the county surveyor for years of Mono County. Uh, Connie, so you might be able to have, maybe able to help you with something there. But Oh, no, everything's very clear, actually. My guys are um, in the field today, so <clears throat> I don't know what I'm going to encounter. But uh, yeah, I was just all excited when I saw Steve's name on as a <laughs> county surveyor and on records there, because yeah. down in Southern California, we don't see quite as much of Steve. So You're right, exactly. That's always a treat. Thank you, Connie. Yeah, and that is a beautiful, beautiful part of the country there. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So, All right. Well, if nobody has anything else. I'm sure it's a, uh, I appreciate it, Steve. I love, uh, I love when we can have you on. So I'm glad you were able to make tonight right. work and, and uh, so much, so much good information in there that, you know, like we talked about in the beginning, there's not enough information on uh, in the 09 manual or a lot of the manuals that go into a uh, lot breakdown. So this was, this was super, might super be useful in the future. It's just spend a little time on some of the, proportionate methods and the difference between yeah. you know grant boundary and irregular boundary and things of that nature uh, you know what does the blm do uh, actually internally with those proportionate types of calculations yeah for sure okay folks thank you steve have a good week have a good week everyone Take care. Bye -bye. Thank you, Steve. That was a great presentation. Absolutely. Amazing. Thank, Thank you. you. I appreciate it all. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.